Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to Parish Reboot, helping people find the way back. So glad you could join us for today's event. My name is Eric Mine. I'm the Canadian Coordinator with Divine Renovation, and um, I'm just so happy that you can join us today. I'm joining the call here near Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada. So where are you joining from? Um, if you haven't already, please do pop your location right in the chat so we can get a sense of where people are joining us from. Be sure to change your chat setting and the little drop down above your chat to all panelists and attendees, which uh, many of you have found I see so that everybody can see where you're joining us from, not just um, the panelists. So thank you for chiming in. People from all over the world, there are uh, getting up to almost 400 of us here on the call here Today, we saw that there was 18 countries represented in the reg registration for the event. So again, so glad that you're able to join us for, for today's timely and really important topic. Um, also on your screen here are um, Hannah Von Spruce, who's the Executive Director of Divine Renovation in the UK. Hello, Aunt Hannah, you can give a wave. And um, Kurt as well, Kurt Clement, who is the newest member of Divine Innovation team. Kurt is in Texas and he's just recently become the executive director for DR in the US. So welcome Kurt. And I should say Hannah is joining from, uh, from London. So we're from all over too, everybody from all over on this call. So we're, uh, we're ready to roll here. Um, for those of you who, who are new, Divine Innovation, it exists to inspire, connect and equip parishes to be on mission to not just um, do maintenance, but to do maintenance and mission so that more and more people can come to know the love and the mercy of Jesus Christ and enter into a, a life-giving relationship and life in his church. And so we found at Divine Renovation three keys to, um, to support that renewal work. The first one is radical reliance on the power of the Holy Spirit. The second is the primacy of evangelization. And the third is the best of leadership. So if it's, again, if it's the first time that you're at one of these online events, you're especially welcome. And you can find more about Divine Renovation at divinerenovation.org. Divine uh, so throughout today's session, uh, it's a, a webinar format for you folks who are familiar with the Zoom settings. But we really encourage you to, to comment in the chat as you, many of you have been doing. So thank you for doing that. Um, but if you have any questions specific to our topic that you'd like the panel to consider and, and try to get to, you can click on the Q&A button, which is at the bottom of your window there and write them there. And we'll try to get to some throughout today's session. A few of us will be on the, on the chat as well and in the Q&A rather, um, responding to some of those questions. And you can also upvote questions that other people have asked by clicking on, I think it's a little thumbs up next to the question that you might especially like and uh, are looking for an answer for. Okay, so that being said, we're going to pray here in a moment and get into today, today's topic about helping people find the way back. And um, this topic really hits close to home, doesn't it? Each of us probably has somebody in our life that is disconnected from God and from the church this past year or before that, even a family member, a friend, a coworker, a neighbor. And, and if you're like me, uh, this part of the world, we've just kind of entered into a fresh kind of lockdown. How can we reach out to those people that, that are, are coming to mind, you know, as we consider this question. So maybe we can keep those people in mind as we, uh, as we pray and ask God to use us however uh, he likes so Kurt, I'm going to kick it over to you. Welcome again. And uh, could you open us in prayer, please? Yeah, great. Well, it's great to be with you all. I'm like, like Eric said, I'm, I'm new on staff at DR, DR USA. So excited for a fresh uh, movement of uh, mission minded parishes and dioceses coming together in a new way in the United States and to be a part of that. Um, I'm one of divine renovations values is from the trenches. You know, we don't operate in theory, but we're practitioners helping other practitioners and, and learning and, and along the way. And so I'm, I'm coming from the trenches. I've been in parish ministry for 25 years at St. Anne parish in the diocese of Dallas, 
but I'm kind of coming out of the trenches to serve parishes and dioceses in a new way. I'm really excited. I'm really excited today. Um, also, I was thinking part of our journey to mission at St. Anne began about seven years ago when we had brought Deacon Keith Strom in to cast vision for what it meant to be a mission missionary parish. And so that one of the first events while I'm on staff would be with Deacon Keith to be a part of the webinar. He's a, so he's a great friend and a great leader around parish renewal. So excited to have him and Kristen in the call today. So let's pray for them and this whole time together. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we just thank you and, and praise you. We thank you for the opportunity to, to gather like this, to to be inspired, to be able to connect, and to hopefully to be equipped, Lord, for the to, to continue to journey forward, to be a part of this great renewal of your church that we b- believe is underway, and that we have great hope that of what you're doing in our church and, and through us and through each of our parishes. So just continue to fill us with hope and, um, and help us to see the opportunities that are always there amidst the the discouragements um, because we follow you and and because of the power of your resurrection we know that um, you make all things new and, and that you're doing something new in this moment so give us the eyes to see that um, especially as we gather here I want, to, I want to pray for all the panelists all those who share and teach and lead and 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 just this whole conversation our whole time together lord we just offer it to you we we pray that you uh, just send your holy spirit upon this gathering, this virtual gathering, all of us collectively, but also into the minds and hearts of all those who speak and share. And so come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Kurt. And thank you, Eric. It's so great to be with everybody here today. Um, We know from the number of people that are joining us, this is such an important topic for us. And the title of this webinar is Parish Reboot, Helping People Find the Way Back. And I know that around the world, we're all in various stages of being in or out of lockdown, opening, reopening churches. Um, But we know as the months go on through this year, we know that we'll be in a stronger position to keep our churches open, hopefully, um, and to have people having the confidence to come back. So I know that as I've been speaking with parishes around the UK, so many of us um, are asking this question. We see so many people have fallen away. Um, And it's not like we were very good at sustaining our numbers even before the pandemic. And so I think um, we're we're concerned about the decline that we could perhaps see um, after this is all over. And so this is the topic today. We know it is a question that is very much on so many people's hearts and minds and I think it's just wonderful that we're all gathered to discuss this and share share the wisdom that um, that all of you are developing as well so please share in the chat ask your questions so I'm really delighted to um, welcome three people who I know are thinking very deeply about these questions and have so much to share with us um, so first of all um, Matt Reggett he's a familiar face around here he's a divine renovation leadership coach Welcome, Matt. That sounds funny to hear a welcome, Matt, but uh, I won't take it personally. It's good to be here. (laughs) And um, our guests today are um, Deacon Keith Strom, um, as Kurt mentioned, who is a deacon of the Archdiocese of Chicago, and he's director of M3 Ministries and a great friend of ours in the ministry. So welcome, Deacon Keith. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here. And last but certainly not least, um, Kristen Bird is joining us, and she is the director of Burning Hearts Disciples Ministry, building a culture of, a culture of intentional discipleship. Um, welcome, Kristen. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, Deacon Keith and Kristen, I'd love to just start with you and just find out a bit, how has the last year been for you in and out of lockdown, quarantining? What's what's it been like? Maybe Deacon Keith, you want to kick off? Oh my, I mean, it's been confusing first and foremost, right? It, it's uh, sometimes it feels like we take three steps forward and two steps back. Um, and, and that has been a challenge. It's been a challenge to see so many people disconnected from, um, uh, just from their faith communities. Uh, It's been a challenge personally in the ministry since so many things sort of shut down and, and 
sort of I had a whole uh, year's worth of work uh, that sort of disappeared in three days uh, in, in March. Um, but it's also been filled with graces. And we've had opportunities in the parishes I'm working with who decided to really step forward and use this time to, to do things we wouldn't normally be able to do. Uh, and that's been a real blessing. So, uh, you know, it's been kind of a mixed bag, but God has been present in all of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. How about you, Kristen? Um, you know, I think it, like Deacon Keith said, it's been crazy. It's been confusing. It's been, you know, all the words that we're using, unpredictable and unprecedented and all those things we used to describe this year, trying to figure out how to serve my family. I have three kids and they're virtual learning sometimes with other kids in our home, my nieces and nephews, and and then trying to figure out what it looks like. How do we, how do we transform and, and change the way that we're sharing the good news because we can't see people in person. Um, for parts of it, or, or we can see some people in person, or we're trying to use video. And so it's just been, a, I feel like, a constant state of change for the past year. Every day seems like there's just something new and something different we're trying to figure out how to navigate. But I also have seen some great signs of hope um, and in some places, just lots of uh, some incredible creativity that's been really inspiring. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Uh I'm remembering we did a webinar, gosh, it was probably a month after lockdown, which seems like forever ago now, right? Or you might be asking, well, which lockdown? <laughs> we did a webinar like a month after lockdown, and it was how to come back in the doors of the church. <laughs> I mean, that, maybe it was wishful thinking, but for a lot of places, they were already trying to figure out how to do that safely and under the restrictions. And here we are like over a year later, and I'm reminded, um, Deacon Keith and Kristen, when we were having a call last week, uh, just to kind of go through this and get our minds around what we even have to share in this, like, because we're not, we're not the experts, we're figuring it out as we go too, right? Right along with people. But, uh, you know, Deacon Keith, you're even kind of pushing back on the title itself. We talk about bringing people back. And because we realize that, like, during the season, people have slipped away from the church, They've slipped away from God. Uh, they've slipped away from maybe just practices they were doing in their lives, not with any intention. Maybe it's just, I slipped away and I, you know, so like, what are you observing now? Or what, what do you think about this, this, even this title of bringing people back? Like, what do you have to say about that? I want you to share kind of what uh, you're sharing in our, in our conversation. Well, first of all, Kristen and I do a lot of work together. So it's very weird to hear her call me Deacon Keith. So that's uh, first and foremost. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I did kind of push back a little bit and, and I've, I've been a part of other webinars and, and other conversations about bringing people back to church. And, and my hope and prayer is that that's not our goal, right? I don't simply want to bring people back into the doors of the church, right? We want to bring them right to the throne of Jesus. We want to bring them to, to the heart of the father. We want to help them connect with, um, with God in ways that then fosters active participation in the sacramental life of the church. But if our goal is just to get them in the door, I feel like what we're doing is just moving back into a model of maintenance where we want to count the number of people who are engaged, right? And, and by engaged, I don't mean in the DR sense of a, a wider um, scope of engagement, but actively just doing things, right? I, I think, uh, I forget who it was that um, uh, somebody said that that our churches should be measured not by how many people show up in our door, but how many people we send out, right? And so in order to do that, we have to help them connect to the Lord uh, in, in a very real way. So that's why I love the title of, of this webinar, How to Bring People Back, because it just sort of leaves that to, to what um, uh, it can be multi-leveled, right? Not only to the active um, practice of their faith, but to, again, a deeper or, or a, a new personal relationship with Christ in the midst of his church. Mm. Yeah, Kristen, what are you observing like in this time, this tumultuous time, like while, while we feel like this whole, you know, group of people have exited the building, like where do we start with that? You know, I think even the question, right, um, how do we bring people back? The, the first thing that I ask is back to what? Which even then I say is probably the wrong question. It's back to who. And by who I mean, obviously, I mean the person of Jesus. I mean the body of Christ that is the church. But I also mean back to who, who are we being 
um, to those who might start to reach out in, in different ways. They might reach out, you know, virtually, they might reach out in person, they might pick up the phone and call and say, hey, what, what's going on? Our mass is open. Is there a way I can come pray? But who are we being? How are we embodying that person of Christ to them? And that kind of radical sense of hospitality as best as we can, given whatever constraints we're under, to make them know that they're loved they're known, they're welcome. And I think that's what's um, the, the places where I'm seeing uh, parishes be the most fruitful, despite whatever restrictions they might be under, is that they have that strong sense of, if we're inviting people back, we're inviting people back to Jesus, and we're inviting people back to ourselves as his disciples, ourselves as people who love them for whoever they are. I think- I love yeah. Oh, can I just jump in for a second? Because I really like that. I mean, in one sense, I, I think what I think what is needed in the church in response to this time is not is not kind of a unique, um, uh, uh, what's the word? Focus, right? It might be unique in its application because we're in a time of pandemic in the 21st century. But I think what we're saying is it's time for the church to be the church. We have to more authentically be who we were created to be and called to be and gifted to be, uh, and really look at life through a missional lens, and then we'll figure out how to do that best in this context. Mm. I, I just I just love what you both are saying, because, you know, you're really um, speaking to the heart of the problem that has been in the church, but that has just been exposed after the, after the last year. And, I, you know, I'm just thinking, getting a bit practical, um, thinking of people who, over the past year, they've realized, actually, I quite like not going to like not physically going to mass. I quite like just watching it or I know in the UK, this is true of, we know lots of young families with children. They just haven't come back because it's, you know, it's easier to just, just, just to stay at home. So if a parish is in that position and they're seeing this, what are some of the things perhaps that they could be doing to, to, to be reaching out to, to these people um, in, in the ways that, that, that you're suggesting? I don't know who wants to jump in on that one. Well, I can I can just say that, you know, um, I, I have three kids and there were times that, you know what? Yeah, it was a lot easier to sit and watch a live stream mass in our yeah. living room with my cup of coffee and some of it because it's easier, right? You don't have all the hassle of trying to get everyone's shoes on and out the door on time, but also because it opened up opportunities for my kids to ask questions about things that were happening and we can start to have conversation now. So one of the things that I know my home parish is working on is actually reaching out to those particularly families to say what and asking the questions, what are you experiencing at home that you wish you could have at church that you wish if you came here in person, we could provide for you? How could we help you engage with your kids in a different way or, you know, whatever the case might be, but you, to just ask the questions because we can make a lot of assumptions about why people aren't coming back. We can make a lot of assumptions about why they prefer a live stream mass. But if we don't ask them and really listen, I think that would be, um, you know, we're missing an opportunity to maybe figure out a different way to engage those families um, and in something to invite them to that actually meets their specific needs and where they are right now. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I think, you know, um, uh, one of the, I think one of the opportunities that we have is that there are there are some real needs that people have in the midst of of the reality that they find themselves in, and if the if the parish, if the church can somehow be a place where they can have those um, those needs met, like one of the things here in the United States, it sometimes can be um, baffling to try to deal with um, our unemployment laws and situations, and so for people who are laid off. Right. I, like, what could we do as parishes to help people who are in that situation? Even having like basically like a, a webinar or a thing where we have people who really are from HR because our parishes have people from all over uh, the spectrum in many different careers. And, and so have human resources or or lawyers or social workers available and just have an evening on how to navigate kind of the the, the unemployment system, how to how to budget, right? How to work, like doing really practical things that meet people's needs. Uh, so that's an opportunity to continue relationship, right? To continue relationship. I mean, I mean, often I, I, would, I would bet that many people who are thinking it's really easier for me to not go back to church, there's a relational aspect that might be missing both with the Lord uh, in an intentional sense, but also with a community, 
And so ways that we can kind of incarnate that, I think make it, um, it just make, make the reality of fellowship um, real for people who are really struggling. You know, our, um, a parish that I know of in our area, when the first lockdowns first happened, the first thing they did was gather a group of people who had, they'd been forming as, as missionary disciples, really understanding this. And they, they parsed out the list of every registered family, every registered household in the parish. And they said, make phone calls. They provided a phone call script to help them make the phone calls. And the questions they asked were, what do you need? You know, are you having trouble finding food? getting to the store? Are you struggling to get your kids figured out virtual, a virtual learning experience? Or maybe you don't have anyone who can sit with them and there's nowhere for them to go. You know, really, really practical things. And then they ended by saying, okay, what is one thing we can pray for? And prayed with them right then on the phone. And the response to those parishes that did that from their people was overwhelming. And one of the number one responses that people would get is, you don't want to ask me for something? They assumed that if the parish was calling them, they were calling because the parish needed Mm -hmm. something, Mm -hmm. not because the parish was offering something. Mm -hmm. And that was just a light bulb moment for me. Like, man, you know, we've been, we've been missing the boat here. How can we be reaching out to people to serve them? um, Especially in this time, instead of only reaching out when we want them to serve us or to serve the parish. And doesn't that set Kristen, doesn't that kind of set the cultural norm we've been used to, right? Like, people have this assumption because the church has maybe created that or a certain parish has created that or a certain environment. This is, this has been allowed, you know, and I I know as a, as a church worker myself at a big church, I I wondered when the lockdown first happened, was I grieving the programs who weren't going to be able to do, or is I grieving the person that wasn't there? And that's a, huge distinction because it's going to formulate how we address it, right? I mean, back to your point, Deacon Keith, about like, or even Kristen, when you're saying like, what are they coming back to? Is it just time to flip the light switch on all the programming we did before? Uh, I'm remembering too, like um, when I first came to the first mask we were allowed back in, um, we, you know, obviously all the restrictions in place, wearing masks. And one of my, my daughter was very afraid to come. She's, she's 10 years old. She was afraid to come back to church. Um, Just, we can get it, the uncertainty, right? We were afraid. A lot of us were afraid. And I remember that first day, though, something my parish did very well, right? In, in the midst of like checking temperatures and hand sanitizing, that the lady behind her mask, while she's hand sanitizing, she said, welcome home. And I could almost cry just telling the story again, because it was like, that was the message. Yes, the protocols are important, but she was in the midst of that, recognizing that radical hospitality that has to be reclaimed because restrictions don't say you're, we, we love you, you're welcome here specifically, right? I mean, they do as we care for people, but we have to send the message that this isn't just ushering people back in a pew. So maybe a question to throw out there, what do we say and not say to people? Like welcome home was a good <laughs> thing to say, right? But when we call them on the phone, when we see them at church, is there a way we should have those conversations maybe to recondition our missional identity, which we've kind of need to reclaim? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, that's a really great question. And um, one of the things I think that we can do as, you know, we've been through a lot, people have been through a lot and to find ways to acknowledge that as a community right? Find ways to acknowledge that. So reach out to, to hear the stories of our people, hear the stories of what they've been through, right? The joy, the fear, the frustration, the sorrow, whatever that might be. And then as a community, find ways to recognize that and to celebrate that and to, and to grieve that. And, and I'm thinking, you know, many people may have lost somebody during the pandemic, may not have been able to get to a funeral, right? Or, you know, or the funeral was live streamed. And, and, so we have this thing that we do right um, on uh, All Souls Day, where we have this kind of massive remembrance, but it doesn't have to be restricted to just All Souls Day in a sense. To really find ways to invite people to to that, have the conversation, hear their stories, and then have the community gather together and really um, um, together uh, worship the Lord in the midst of that and acknowledge what has happened. Yeah, I I agree. And I think, you know, it's funny because I I get that there's a question about what should we say or not say. And I think it's more, I think we would be better off to have a 
posture of listening, of asking questions of people. And even when they just come in the door, even in that moment, to have that like deeper sense of, hey, it's so good to see you. How have you been doing? But to ask it in a way that's not just the, hey, how are you? Fine. You know, you keep walking. But to get that sense of, I really want to know what this has been like for you. I really want to know what's going on with you. There's a diocese um, in the U.S. that when their uh, diocesan curious staff started coming back on campus to work, the first thing they did was hold um Heal, they call them healing hope and hospitality, like small group sessions, where they just gave every office the opportunity to gather and say, what was this like for you? What's been the greatest struggle for you of living this past year before you, you know, came back on campus? What's been the greatest joy? Where have you seen God working? And they would just do, I mean, it was like one staff meeting mm. bef- as everyone gathered back to just give people a chance to kind of process through that and recognize this has been an experience. So to, to really offer that opportunity to listen and for them to listen to each other. I love, I love the practical things that you guys are sharing because mm-hmm. I know there are hundreds of people all around the world taking notes and they're going to be um, doing some of this stuff in their own context. So it's just really wonderful. Um, and thank you so much for everyone sharing in the chat. There's just some brilliant discussion going on there, some fantastic things that we can learn from each other and, and the questions as well. Keep them coming because we'll, we'll be putting some of the questions live as well to, to Deacon Keith and Kristen. Um, One thing I'm thinking is, you know, as we kind of um, go back to to normal, we're never really going to be back to normal, but as we kind of move back to some kind of normality, the danger of falling into old mindsets and actually losing some of the momentum we've already created through the last year, because I think parishes have learned to to pivot frequently over the last year. They've learned kind of an agility that we perhaps didn't have before because we were just stuck in this rut. And... um, this danger of falling into old mindsets, I think, is is a real danger. So I just wonder whether either of you would speak into into that. How do we keep the momentum of of continuing to to lead well, um, even when we start going back to to normal church church practice? Um, I think that one of the first things that we need to start thinking about is when we talk about going back or bringing things back or bringing programs back or experiences back that after the sacraments, after the sacraments, we need to be really intentional about what we choose to reopen, Mm. about what we choose to do. Because the reason we can be nimble and pivot so quickly is because our time is not spent now with all of the administrative details of running some of these programs, some of which are very mission-minded in some cases, but some of which are, you know, I, the, the chili cook-off that we've been doing for 30 years in our parish because it's what we do. And so when everything is put on pause, I think we have an incredible opportunity to say, what do we choose to start back up and when? To make sure that we give ourselves the time and the freedom and just the emotional and energy resources to continue to be able to be nimble. Because our ability to pivot quickly goes away when we get swamped with work, right? With maintenance work that we have to do. So the more that we can start to be really intentional about maybe not opening everything back up that we were doing before, the the better we're gonna be able to say, okay, how can we provide ourselves that space for, for that nimbleness? Yeah, and I, I think it kind of goes back to some of the principles for divine renovation is that it gives this, this period of time can give us an opportunity to clarify our vision mm-hmm. because what you stop and what you don't stop and what you do and what you don't do really should kind of flow from that reality of who are we and who is God calling us to be in our parish context, right? Um, and one of the things that's been a blessing for, uh, for me, I'm, I'm um, I was going to say stationed, but I'm assigned to uh, a parish in uh, the suburbs of Chicago And the pastor and leadership team really took a a kind of a bold step and said, you know, we're not going to restart anything like none of our ministries, except for our liturgical ministries are going to restart until um, we go, we go through a process with the ministry leads of reflection on our vision, mission, and values. And so uh, we kind of called it a ministry charter process. And so, uh, and so we walked with them and really tried to help them reflect on um, how will this ministry, when it restarts, um, live out our mission, which is very clearly stated in the parish. How will it, how will it live out? How will it incarnate the, the four values that we have adopted in very concrete ways? And also including 
how will it search for the next generation of leadership? And then that group uh, of leaders would meet with the leadership team and they would have a period of discernment. And uh, if it seemed like, yeah, this is, this is a ministry that's really moving and ready to support the mission and values, then it was uh, deemed ready to restart. Um, and it wasn't an easy process and we're still going through it. And it's not a, it, it hasn't been without its conflict, of course, um, but it's borne real fruit. And we've been very intentional about what we restart and we've used it as an opportunity to help the leaders of those ministries be formed in, in, in really who we believe God is calling us to be. So that's one opportunity in terms of what we start and what we don't start that we can jump on. Even now, still, there's still time. Yeah. And, you know, my, my home parish, so my ministry, um, obviously everything went on pause um, with the ministry that I do in um, diocese and parishes other than my home parish. Um, that's kind of where all my, all my extra energy got to be able, um, I was able to invest there and it, it's been fantastic. And one of the things that my home parish has done is say, we have an opportunity now to even look at evangelizing the structures of our parish about mm. putting not just our, each of our programs on mission, and not just making sure we've adopted our mission statement across each you know, um, area that we have, but to really say, does our structure align to this mission? Um, and that has been a great fruit that's come out of this pandemic is to say, okay, how can we realign our whole staff, our leadership, all of that to make it so that everything now is going to support mission. So doing the things that Deacon Keith just talked about, where you walk through each thing that you're doing and say, how does it work? And then just take a step back and look at kind of the, the, the 10,000 foot view and say, okay, but now are we able to do that given the structures that we have in place? Do we have a strategic plan? And does that plan, is that plan supported by the way our staff is set up, the way our councils work, the way our leadership works, all of that. And that's been a great fruit that's come out of it that we would not have had the time, energy, or freedom to do probably before. Yeah. I think in some ways we hamstring ourselves if we try to figure out how do we help bring people back and how do we be more missional? And then basically what we try to do is how do we be more missional in our current structure? How do, how do we fit mission into our structure, which is right. primarily maintenance oriented anyway? Um, and so this is a real opportunity. We did that very same thing at our parish and basically blew up our parish structure and, uh, and re reconstituted it around mission. Uh, and again, it's just still experimental and, and we're trying to live it out. But it, it, I think I hear this all the time. It's like, well, and you probably do too, Divine Renovation. We'd love to, to work with Divine Renovation, but we can't work with Divine Renovation and do all the things that we're currently doing. Right. And so the next question is, okay, well, what things can you stop so that you can begin to, uh, to work with us or, or how can we reformulate um, just the basic structure of the parish? And I'm not talking about obviously not getting rid of the pastor, but, but you know, how does the pastoral council, just to be clear, just to be clear, I always, because everybody thinks that once I start talking, people get, they have some, yeah. They think I'm insane. You can email your comments at (laughs) deaconkeith. But, but really, uh, how does the pastoral council work with uh, the finance council? How, what is the relationship of the staff? How does the support staff of the administration, how are they brought into the reality of mission? How do they see their roles? It's, like, it's really fundamental things that we, we have this opportunity to, to recast during this time. And it, doesn't, it sounds like, it sounds so dreamy, like, hey, we've got this perfect opportunity, but just as the pandemic has made people very uncomfortable, so does any sort of shift in this stuff, you know, like, uh, if, can you imagine in a pre pandemic world, like changing a mass time or, or right. doing away with one, like the pastor would, you know, be, be changed, not because the bishop did, <laughs> because the people would carry him out. Right. Right. And, and it's, it's that kind of discomfort that like, I don't know that we're quite ready for that discomfort. That's going to happen as we make some of these shifts, but the, but the invitation, like, are we ever going to have another opportunity to really address those structures like we do now? If we usher everything back and we turn all the faucets back on, everything flows like it used to, Mm -hmm. nobody's going to have any time to look at it again. Everybody's going to get settled back in their ways and we're going to be back to business as usual, which some people will love. Right. But those of us that are on this call today, I think that realize that like, there's something more at stake and that's the hearts of the people or the re-engagement of the people. And you you talked about these, even evangelizing the structures. Uh, Kurt Clement, you know, our our, uh, regional coordinator, executive director for the U.S. at his parish, they realized how much that needed to happen and they did it because they had arrived at a place on this journey 
that no one had maybe been before. And they looked back at their previous structure and like, we want to really focus on evangelization, but we have one person on staff that does that. We've got 15 in the catechetical office, which maybe we need to look at how the proportions of time, resources, and energy we spend when we open back up. Like, do we have, have we addressed uh, online ministry? What that's going to look like? Is there uh, a digital communication person or responsibility? Or do we just give that to the to the youth minister because they tend to be the most digitally creative, right? And the so youngest. we do have to rethink that stuff. Uh, we all know that as former, former youth ministers, but, you know, I don't know that we'll have this opportunity again. So it really is that kind of seize the moment. So as we shift this, like what we do next, I think question about what it looks like to be invitational in this new culture. So as we look at a post COVID church, or maybe it's always going to be living with it, but like in this church, which has COVID as this backdrop that we, we have to deal with, how does invitational culture differ now than maybe it did in the past? What do we need to change around our invitational mindset? Yeah. I, I would just say this. I mean, you, you brought up a point and I just, I feel like I need to, there's a prompting here, or it could Please. just be the breakfast I had earlier. Um, <laughs> but uh, I really thought you said we're not ready to have to, to kind of embrace that or experience that kind of, of disruption. Um, and I would just say this, that, that uh, if we don't, if we don't really move in this place and really discern and embrace that disruption, then what we're going to find is that our parishes are going to just continue to decline. Um, so I don't think, I don't think a faith community will be able to survive um, without taking a hard look at this. And this is the acceleration of the pandemic. This was true two years ago. Right. But now there's now there's more of a reality. Our structures are not uh, are not sustainable and are not built for mission, particularly in North America, which is where my expertise really is. Right. We, we in, in, in the United States, we were kind of an immigrant church. You build it, they will come. Right. Even now we have parts, even in Kurt's area in Texas, you have parts of 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 the United States where they're building parishes, not because of evangel, you know, not because evangelization fruit. Um, or, you know, you know, kind of that missionary activity, but because of demographics that are shifting, right? But if we don't really embrace this, I think 5, 10, 15 years, our communities are going to be practically non-existent. Those who don't move forward in this way mm. will find themselves really in a place of barrenness. Mm. I think that, you know, we have to, the thing that's happening right now is we're starting to reap the fruits of what's been not in the last 12 months. We're reaping the fruits of what's been for the last, I don't know, pick your, you know, numbers of years in the way that we've lived as church. The longer we've been on maintenance instead of, you know, focusing on maintenance instead of mission, the more we have people who, when before COVID, when they were coming, they were coming out of maybe unreflected habit, not like virtue habit, right? Or the practicing of the faith, but just habit or guilt or obligation or whatever. Well, all of those reasons have gone away. And so what we're seeing now, like Deacon Key says, the acceleration of us reaping the fruits of what's happened before and, and who we've been before. So we really have to take a long, hard look. You know, your question, Matt, about what does it mean to be invitational, I think is key because, it, again, it's the what are we inviting them to? Who are we inviting them to? And to say it's not just enough to have people in the seats. It's not just enough to have people inside so we really have to take a long, hard look at how are we inviting people to think differently about their lives? How are we inviting them to encounter with the good news? You know, what does that look like? And that's, that shifts. And part of the challenge is it feels like that's not scalable. And I don't know about other places in the world, but in the U.S., we're going to make it bigger. We're going to make it faster. We're going to make it more efficient. <laughs> like that's our goal with everything. And you, this is going to move at the speed of relationship. It's going to move at the speed of relationship and that's not scalable. We can't make it bigger, mm -hmm. faster, and more efficient. Mm -hmm. It is one on one. You know, how did Jesus do it? One person to 12 people like, and then really only three, if you really take a look at it, that he really invested his time in. And so what does it mean to be invitational? I think is going to look like it's going to look smaller um, in a lot of cases, but I think that's a good thing because I think we'll be able to invest in relationship in a different way. So are you saying the bulletin might not be part of that invitational culture we want to set? Matt, my parish got rid of the bulletin. We got rid of the bulletin. And as <laughs> someone who worked on the bulletin, I am thrilled. 
world. <laughs> now we still have other ways we're communicating. So I'm just, yes, right, right, right? right. we're still communicating with our parish. We haven't completely given up all of those things, but um, yeah, the freedom that comes from that, right. Cause there's not, we aren't building relationship in the bulletin. I love that. And, and I think we kind of need to give ourselves that permission to move at the speed of relationship, which is another thing from Kristen that I'll be stealing just so you know, Kristen, um, I wrote that, it down too. Yeah, good. I mean that that honestly, like I, I think that there's, I think there's a lot of excitement about you know processes like Alpha, and and I certainly you know uh, love and support it, but there's almost an expectation that we're going to run like one season of Alpha and then boom, we're we're off to the races and we're going to have everything humming and 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 again, it's about investing in people, it's about pouring into them and and the fruit of that, and then after a while, it's like. There was a commercial in the United States in the 70s. I forget that it was maybe Herbal Essence or some shampoo commercial, but it's like, you know, I, I used the shampoo and then I told two friends and then they told two friends and then they told two friends and then the screen just fills up with people, right? That's the reality of spiritual multiplication. And so it's like a snowball that will turn into like a gradually an avalanche, right? But it starts off, we just have to give ourselves permission to let this take the time it takes. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, Question from Father Derek, just looking at the questions. Um, I'd love to throw this to one of you. Um, just in terms of thinking about what we restart and what we and what we start up again and don't start. Um, thinking about this theme of relationships that you've been speaking about so well, what are the kind of concrete steps that you would take in discerning this? Um, or maybe kind of short, medium, long-term steps. I think that, you know, the first thing, at least in, in, in our parish that we did was, you know, there's the, there's the immediate need. So what are the immediate needs? So that was like the phone calling trees and whatever to find out what do people need? And that's like an, an urgent situation, right? In a short term. But then as we took a step back, it was to say, okay, let's start to look at everything that's going on in our parish. And for us, it was everything that has a line item in the budget, everything that takes up space in our building and everything that's on a staff member's calendar, right? And if it's, and just assess all of it to the mission and our parish did the same thing. We came up with a really concrete mission and vision. And so how can we make sure that everything is working toward mission? And what we did then is to say, okay, the things that are already really concretely and greatly aligned to this, those are the first, those are the short term things to start up. And what are the things we need to get other things going? So we recognize the need to continue our discipleship formation because we need these people who had already started that process to really get engaged in helping us with what's coming next. And then we said, what are the things that just need a little tweak to get them more on mission? And that's kind of the medium term. And the long term are either brand new things we wanted to start or things that have been way off base and are going to need a lot of work to bring them aligned to mission. At least, at least in, in one of the parishes I, I work with in my home parish, that's what we did. And it, and it seemed to help us kind of gauge that what goes now and then like the short, medium and long term. Yeah. And I think we engaged in a very similar process, <clears throat> excuse me, in my parish and, and some of the other parishes that I've that I've worked with. But again, I, I think the piece, the grounding has to be, do you, do you have a sense of what your community is about and, and where you're called to be? Um, you know, like, like the, what, what's, what you want to begin with the end in mind, so to speak. Uh, and that is, that is really, really helpful. And, you know, Matt, you brought this up, you know, well, we got this. It sounds so easy. It sounds so dreamy. You just kind of do it. Like this is hard work and mm -hmm. it is, impossible one without the presence of the Holy Spirit and, you know, and, and the presence of God, but also it's going to involve conflict, right? I, I'll, I'll be real. I'm just going to say this. I, I work with a parish that's been going through this, this process and they had um, a St. Vincent de Paul society conference, which is kind of a beautiful uh, apostolate that works to serve uh, the poor uh, and those who are in need. And they disbanded as a conference rather than go through this process of, um, reflecting on the vision, mission, and values. I mean, they just didn't want to do it. And so they just, they said, no, we're done. Uh, and, and so how did we deal with that? How do we deal with them pastorally, right? How did we, how do we make sure that those in within our parish boundaries that have real needs could be met? How could we meet them? Like these are, these are things that this brings up. Um, and so I just think we need, we just need to be prepared and, 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 and pastoral courage is essential in this process. Yeah. The, <laughs> Pastoral courage is hard too, just because we realize how many 
people we're trying to serve, how many different opinions are out there that we hear from some people that are complaining and we hear from other people that are urging us. So it's all the voices, right? And I realize as a, as a pastoral leader, the heavy weight that, that each of them carry. Um, and as we look like it being more invitational, one of those is our medium. So I, I know we pick on the bulletin because not that the bulletin of itself is bad, right? But because a lot of times we just assume that's what we do. We put it in the bulletin and they will come. Right. And in this digital world, that doesn't work. Maybe it never really worked completely. We just assumed and hoped and prayed, well, that's the only way we knew. What are some ways we can be creatively invitational? What other mediums can we be using to, to reach people, especially as we talk about younger families and kids and millennials and Gen Zers? How, we're, how are we needing to engage them in an invitational way? Well, so I can, I mean, I can answer that as someone who fits in that demographic, but I'll tell you that the, the parish that I work in now, we are 66% of our parish is over the age of 66. <laughs> um, and so for us, it's been a matter of how do we engage with the folks who are older, who in some cases are way less comfortable with the technology. So we can have the social media, the YouTubes, you know, Facebook, Instagram, right. all of that webinars, all of that to engage with folks email, text messages. There's so many great resources out there, but our parish's bigger challenge has been how do we engage with those who aren't connected mm. digitally? And, you know, I will just tell you that I cannot express the value of a phone call. Like I, it, pick up the phone, pick up the phone and call folks and ask them, you know, what do they need and connect them with the thing that's going on or the ministry or the support in, in your parish or in your local community that's going to best reach their need right now. I mean, that's really the best, the best way. We also do like, like mail things out to some of our older parishioners, things like that. But, you know, I think we have to use, we can't just get rid of what we were doing before and move everything digital either. Cause we run the risk of leaving some folks behind there as well. So it's gotta be a little both and, um, and it's a challenging balance to walk for sure, but let's take advantage of some of those resources and tools that are out there. And then let's also remember that the first tool is knock on the door, pick up the phone, you know, depending on where your, your community situation is right now. And, and that's, and that's challenging because it's less efficient, mm -hmm. right? It is less efficient. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I, 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 we get robo calls, right. From, from parishes, like we have a, a parish that'll give like around Ash Wednesday, they'll robo call all of the, all of the parishioners. So you pick up the phone and then the, the pastor has a message, uh, right there. You know, you answer the phone. I mean, that's, I guess, another way of, of communicating, but being invitational, the best, the best kind of invitation is the personal invitation. The most effective kind of invitation is you know, not just reading about something. So, and so we've been trying to use really creative ways. Like we do, the, the pastor gives a, you know, there's a weekly letter that gets emailed out to people. Um, the, it goes up on our website. The, our pastor does videos uh, as well that he just pops up on the website, um, which is, you know, it doesn't take that much technical um, skill to just navigate to a website, but we still have people in our parish who, who don't. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, they've done, we've done the phone call tree. I mean, all of those things, we just have to be, just, you have to, you have to blanket everything. And in a time like this, and I think always, we really need to kind of over communicate, right. And rather than, rather than under communicate, it's never, whatever we think we're doing, we, we probably need to do more because it's always amazing. Maybe you've had this experience, you bring, you, you were having a big event or a big initiative and you think you've broadcasted everywhere and you've talked about it at the pulpit and it's in the bulletin and it's on the website and you've been, and then people go, I didn't know that was happening. Right. So we have to really, we have to be really intentional about our communication and use every Avenue that we have available. Yeah. Love this so much guys. Um, we've maybe got um, time for one more question and, um, there's one here saying how do diocesan leaders form and support parish leaders in discernment? and to truly discern implementing mission in their parish or local area? Which is a great question, because I know there'll be lots of diocesan leaders on this call right now too. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna say that uh, I think in the work that I do and the things that I see, the most support that you can provide is teach them, or engage with them, build relationship with them, and then teach them how to pray, teach them how to discern, practice it with folks. Give them opportunities to do discernment in a group, you know, with one another, test it out, you know, all that, that kind of stuff is so valuable. 
for folks. And so many of us um, have not had formal experiences of that. We haven't had, you know, a, a school of prayer that we've been able to enter into that has taught us all these different forms of listening, of recognizing the Holy Spirit's voice and how he's moving us. And so the more that we can really, and especially diocesan leaders, just be engaging in, in modeling what we're talking about. So build relationships first. And then really, if it's about that discernment, give them experiences of it, practice with them, provide them the opportunities to try it out and test it out and, and do some of this in a safe environment and in, in a relationship situation, a smaller group so that then they can feel confident um, when they go out and do it in, uh, in their parish. And, and I think I'm going to say this, sometimes I say things and I get myself in trouble. So but I'm going to say this. How, one of the ways that diocesan leaders can support um, parish leaders in this in parishes is, is get out of the way. Um, and so here, here's, here's what I mean by that. The same process that parishes have to go through in terms of discerning what to keep and what not to keep, the diocese should also do and reflect what requirements are we asking of our parishes? What are the ways in which we communicate, right? I mean, in... in our, the Archdiocese of Chicago recently reformed this, but every office would send out its own unique communication to every parish. And so you, you would end up having like 15 or 20 different communications during the course of the week from the diocese. So just reflect, uh, what are the things that are essential at the diocesan level to keep requirements, but also uh, uh, initiatives, and then do exactly what, what Kristen has suggested, right? But it has to, we have to model what we're asking our people to model in the same way that we have to model a life of discipleship to those whom we are trying to, to help mature uh, in a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's that same principle. Very good. Thank you so much. I, I love that. You're, I will never work in the diocese again, apparently, after that comment, <laughs> but that's the reality. Yeah, well, it's a, brilliant, you know, it's a brilliant relationship to reflect on, you know, people here are working for parishes, dioceses, and that relationship is so important for all of, for, for mission to be working fruitfully. So to reflect on that is is critical. So um, Deacon Keith and Kristen, thank you so much um, for, you for everything that you've shared today. There's been so many practical things that we've, um, that we've been taking away. I just know that this conversation has, has just been so rich. I've learned so much. I love reading the different things that people have shared about their own parishes. So thank you so much for your time and for sharing all that you have today. Um, we're just going to wrap up. I'm going to hand back over to Eric, who's going to share with us a few things that we've got coming up in Divine Renovation. Thanks, Hannah. Yeah, I'll echo your sentiments. Uh, Deacon Keith and Kristen, thank you so much for uh, sharing, unpacking these, these challenging and uh, important topics. I, I heard yeah, so much of what you shared. Um, so much of this is not a, like a quick fix, as, as you mentioned throughout the conversation. This is hard work, and it takes prayer, intentionality, and a lot of effort to get uh, this kind of change that we want happening. So thank you for starting to unpack that for us today. And thank you all for joining us for this uh, awesome conversation. Before you go really quick, we have a big announcement that we wanted to share with all of you uh, as we close our session today. On Wednesday, June 2nd, we're very pleased to be hosting Father Mike Schmitz for an online event called The Holy Spirit's Role in Renewing the Church. And uh, many of you perhaps have heard Father Mike his uh, Bible in a Year podcast is, uh, well, it was, or maybe it still is, the number one podcast in the United States, uh, anyway, recently. Uh, maybe it still is. Maybe you can let me know in the chat uh, where his standing is. But anyway, he does this great Bible in a Year. He's involved in lots of different ministries, and we're really pleased to be hosting him to unpack renewal, especially in the state of the, uh, the, the church, and have some, we're going to have some prayer ministry towards the end of that call as well. So you won't want to miss that. So we'll put a link in the chat and then include it in our email follow up to all of you to register and please join us on Wednesday, June 2nd, you can find the time zone uh, as you register or on our website. Uh, two quick things for all you priests on the call. In the meantime, in the second week of May, we're hosting a, a priest only session called It's About Time, Managing Time to Prioritize Mission. And this is gonna be a series of, of three events at different times, but with the same topic. It's just happening on different days. Um, in North America, it's on May 11th, May 13th for Australasia and uh, May 14th 
for the UK. So fathers, if you're not from one of those places, you can join the one that, that works for you. Um, so if you're, you're a priest on this call, you are most welcome to those sessions happening the second week of May. And if you're a priest, your, your pastor isn't on this call. I saw a few in the, the chat, you know, how do we invite our, our pastor to, to consider and look at some of these topics? This could be a great way to invite them. So please forward him that, that info. Again, we'll send that out to you via email. Uh, the second thing is our program in Divine Renovation called Kickstart. So uh, again, fathers on the call, if you've been interested by some of the topics and the principles that have started to be unpacked here, Kickstart is a six session priest cohort coached um, program that we're running with Divine Renovation that looks at things like vision, things like leadership team, uh, the primacy of evangelization, some structure, culture stuff at the parish. It's a, it's a kickstart to help you to look in a new way or to renew your efforts at renewal in your parish. So if you're interested or if you think your priest might be interested for those uh, lay people here on, on the call, please do send them along to our website where you can find information about kickstart and how you can apply to join us for those sessions. We'll wrap up here in a prayer. I think that is it for us. Thank you so much again for joining us for this session. We will send a follow-up email shortly to, uh, with those items that I just mentioned. So let's pray now to close our time together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we are so grateful for your presence with us. We're so grateful for your longing for those who have wandered away from you, Lord. And we want to be a part of what you're doing. We want to have your heart for those who have uh, wandered away. So please send your Holy Spirit to fill our hearts and our minds with, with your longing for them, with your heart. Please direct us, Holy Spirit, guide us and lead us to know how we might reach those in our families, in our workplaces, our neighbors, our friends who don't know you, who don't know you, Jesus. We want them to know you. We want to invite them back to you, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. So help us to know how to do that. Give us the courage to do it. Give us the grace to know how. And we thank you for this time to unpack this topic. Please let it bear fruit, even in eternal life. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks again, everyone. And we'll be in touch. God bless you all. Bye-bye.